Hello, everybody, and welcome to Cultivating Inclusive Open Educational Practices with the Open Education Network's Certificate in Open Educational Practices. This session will introduce the certificate program in its pilot stage, generously funded by the Institute of Museum and Library Services. The development of this program has intentionally brought together diverse stakeholders invested in open education to develop the shared vocabulary vocabulary, explore the collaborative tools, and build a community that can make the aspirations of open education tangible at their own institutions. Join us to learn more about the program and explore strategies for developing open practices and pedagogies at your own institution that knit together local communities and tap into a global body of practice. I'd like to take a moment to introduce our team who spent several months crafting an online course with the basics and open educational practices as founded in social justice, with the outcome being a customizable action plan that helps faculty and librarian teams decide upon student learning to transform through the application of open pedagogy. We have Rachel Brooks from North Carolina Central University who served as our instructional designer. Will Cross from North Carolina State University, who served as our copyright specialist and open pedagogy practitioner. Myself, Tanya Groves from the Open Education Network, who served as the project manager. Heather Maselli from Roger Williams University served as our faculty specialist in open pedagogy. Jasmine Roberts Cruz from the Ohio State University served as our social justice specialist. And Lindsay Gum from Roger Williams University served as our library specialist and open pedagogy practitioner. And a special thanks to additional team members who aren't with us today, Michael Caudry at Leeward Community College in Hawaii, who served as our curriculum specialist, and Hannah Davidson at Plymouth State University, who served as our accessibility specialist. Thank you for joining us today to hear about the Certificate in Open Educational Practices. So one of our major goals for this project was from its inception was to push the conversation in open education beyond simply textbooks. Um, Tanya, if you could switch the slide, please. Um, using OER by itself is not always quote unquote transformational. Obviously re replacing traditional textbooks with OER is vitally important to ensuring equitable access to information in classrooms. As you can see along the bottom, um, of this matrix using an OER textbook can increase financial equity in your classrooms. Um, however, adopting an OER textbook in a traditional banking model course doesn't advance student learning in ways that we know we can accomplish with open educational practices. And we wanted to help faculty and librarians to explore possibilities of advancing pedagogy using OER. Our course highlights various open educational practices and leads instructors in developing a plan for how to teach using the OEP of their choice and hopefully ending up in that top corner where we're using open teaching practices and OER textbooks to advance equity. And now I'm going to turn it over to Jasmine who's going to talk about our social justice perspective. Yeah, so one of the things we attempted to do when creating the certificate program is design it with social justice outcomes in mind. So now I wanna go ahead and explain what is social justice education because it can mean different things to different people and also how that applies to our certificate program. So Marilyn Cochran Smith defines social justice education as a practice, right? And pedagogy that actively addresses oppression, power, privilege, and all the other isms that result from social injustice, racism, classism, sexism, things of that sort. So to that end, the goal of the certificate program is to really have participants truly engage in this process so that people can come into the classroom space and have the liberty to experience the full spectrum of their humanity. But how do we exactly do that, right? <laughs> I think it's really helpful to kind of dissect social justice education, even more so that we can see how it applies in our classrooms. So on the next slide, um, Kent State's public administration department actually uh, come up, came up excuse me, with uh, five social justice principles of education that I think can be a guide for all of us. So let's take a look at the first principle, access, right? Meaning access to resources that could affect your ability to fully participate or in the case of lack of access to resources that create imbalance uh, and imbalance in power dynamics. And then we have equity. So that is the effort and or resources required to accomplish a particular outcome. Some students may need certain resources or even more resources compared to other students. 
And also, I want to be clear here that same treatment treatment is not to be confused with fair treatment, right? And we address that in our certificate program as well. And then the third principle, diversity is being and the value of the uniqueness of people's different lived experiences. Uh, this fourth principle um, I really, really like, which is participation. So that's the opportunity and platform to participate in um, making the policies that affect our well-being, right? So notice how this is different from how so many traditionally define inclusion, right? Which is often confused with participation or even belonging. So inclusion means being brought into a situation that has already been made or policies have already been defined rather than being asked to participate in the policy making process. And then the last principle, human rights. So that's the dignity that all humans are entitled to have fully or to fully participate in their human experience in an abundant way. So what we try to achieve in this certificate program is encouraging and showing participants how they can achieve most of the social justice uh, principles in their own open and project or practice. Because, you know, for example, simply including students in a learning situation that reinforces traditional structures is not creating a socially just classroom. Social justice really gets them closer to having the freedom to experience their full humanity, humanity by challenging uh, systemic structures or the way that things are done, like I mentioned earlier. So now I'm going to go ahead and pass it back to Heather, who will explain a bit more how the program was designed with accessibility in mind, which, of course, is one of the social justice principles. Yes, we took accessibility really serious in this course, um, and we were exceptionally lucky to have the expertise of Hannah Davison from Plymouth State University on our team to guide us in developing the outcomes for accessibility um, that we want our participants to learn. Um, it's actually a full module in our course uh, that we decided was important that if faculty and librarians are going to be creating or using open educational practices, um, those practices should be accessible to all of their students. Um, but we also made sure uh, that Hannah combed through the extensive course to make sure the program itself was accessible in every way to our participants. And if you look at the next slide, Hannah has this wonderful quote that she shared with us um, that she was really excited to be part of a project that centered accessibility and social justice um, in its design um, rather than an addition or an afterthought as sometimes it usually is. And now I'm going to pass this to Lindsay who's going to talk about our, our, envision, our vision for the CERT. Thanks Heather. Hi everyone. Um, so when we as a team were envisioning this certificate program, we really wanted to honor and recognize that faculty librarian collaborations in this space are really necessary. Um, neither party can do it all and both bring unique skill sets and professional perspectives that support our students in their learning. Um, and the impetus for this certificate program was really born out of a previous collaboration and research conducted by uh, myself, Will, and Heather back in 2020. So we interviewed faculty who were engaged in this work at varying levels. And a common thread that we identified in almost all of the interviews was this idea that you don't know what you don't know. Next slide, thanks. So faculty, you know, they really want to do this work, but they aren't always sure about what considerations are necessary to ensure this work is being done both ethically and legally by our students um, or how to center student agency from start to finish. So it's not just an afterthought when the talk of licensing their work comes up at the end of the semester, right? So part of my job as a scholarly communications librarian entails advocating for and helping to center um, our student agency in their various scholarly endeavors which you know, might include their classroom assignments where public sharing of intellectual output is incorporated. So I can act as a sounding board for my faculty members as they share with me their goals around OEP. And I can identify critical points in the process that students would benefit from counseling. So for example, um, helping faculty understand, you know, it might be really important right now in your semester to learn about copyright and creative commons. Um, I can help them understand the ethos behind and the implications of sharing scholarship openly, um, understanding how and why BIPOC folks have been traditionally um, marginalized by the traditional process of scholarly 
um, publishing and also most importantly, provide them with some interventions that they can help to enact um, to rectify those and several others. So we wanted to take these experiences that um, a lot of us have had and kind of incorporate it into this course. So ultimately our intention in envisioning this certificate program was to create professional development that would help partners not only understand how one another's expertise fits into the process of implementing OEP, but also in a way that centers um, principles of social justice, as mentioned by Jasmine, um, throughout the entire process. Again, so it's not you know just an afterthought. Um, so while we recognize that librarians are certainly not always the only individuals um, who support faculty in OEP, we definitely you know understand that they are the professionals right now that are most heavily um, dependent upon um, but it is our intention that with future offerings of this certificate we will expand to other faculty support roles which is really really exciting um, so now i'm going to hand it over to my colleague rachel brooks and she'll walk us through kind of the the development of the course itself Thank you so much. So in our development of the course, we were very intentional about working expeditiously, but making sure that we were scaffolding the process. And in doing so, we approached this in a four phase um, development strategy. That first phase included developing the course level and module level objectives that described outcomes that were measurable and observable. Our second phase associated with the creation of aligned assessments, instructional materials, and learning activities for our faculty and our library colleagues. In the third phase, we collaboratively developed a prototype module as well as a course mapping matrix to ensure clear alignment between the content. And then finally, we cooperatively developed the rest of the modules based on that um, prototype module and the supplementary items. Now on the next slide, we see how we approached the um, development of the certification course very transparently. And we did so by first identifying in each of the learning activities and assessments, what were the outcomes, the learning outcomes for those specific activities. We provided a clear description and purpose of each activity, as well as step-by-step -step directions for the completion by our faculty and library colleagues. We provided success criteria in the form of assessment for each activity and assessment. And then finally, we identified the various materials and technology needed to successfully complete each activity or assessment. Following that, on the next slide, we can see where we created each of the modules. And so I had mentioned we did so by first creating a prototype module and then replicated or at least replicated the process in the remaining modules. And we did so by ensuring a common structure where we started with an overview of each module, which included a narrative introduction, as well as the module objectives, the various instructional materials, such as open textbook selections, websites and videos and other resources for creating OER. And then finally, we included a variety of learning activities and assessments to support the progress and the success of our faculty and library colleagues. And so now my colleague Will Cross is going to provide additional information regarding supporting open educational practices. Thank you so much, Rachel. So exactly as you said, before we close, we wanted to offer a few observations about doing and supporting open educational practices. First and foremost, we wanted to recognize that OEP isn't a binary on-off switch. So on the next slide, we talk about how it can take many forms. Thank you, Tanya, sorry for being confusing. OEP can take many forms that connect our values and practices. It may look like individual renewable assignments integrated into an existing course, or like flipping an entire course to open. But OEP can also be smaller open interventions, like more inclusive syllabus language or course policies that are less punitive. OEP can also be no more and no less than a genuine commitment to articulating and enacting values of respect, agency, and criticality in the ways you interact with each other. There's no one size fits all here. On the next slide, we talk about working with OEP on your campus. And likewise here, we see that there are many different ways to support OEP on an individual campus. Many OEP projects come out of a specific individual need a problem that can only be solved or best solved by using OEP, or by a faculty member who wants to try something new. 
Existing OER initiatives can also incorporate OEP into a menu of services that include textbook reviews, adoptions, and so forth. And there are plenty of opportunities to intentionally launch a program as a special event or an ongoing community of practice. There's no wrong way to do this stuff as long as you're supporting inclusion, student agency, and meaningful creation. And now I'm going to turn the mic back over to Tanya to talk a little bit about our first cohort and then to invite you to share your own questions and observations. So we are very excited that the first cohort began September of this year of 2022, and we're so thankful to IMLS uh, for the planning grant that we were awarded to cover the librarian instructors, the 30 of their, uh, their participant fees. Uh, there are four instructors. Uh, we are considering this entire program to be iterative, iterative uh, for continuous improvement. We are continuously getting participant feedback and keeping notes for next time. And we are very much hoping to launch a second cohort next fall. We're seeing an outpouring of need. Uh, we got three times the number of applicants this time. And so we are excited to continue this good work. So thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, our email's on the screen uh, if you'd like to get in touch with us. Thank you.